Hello there, my name is Jonathan McIntosh and in this video I would like to talk to you about aesthetics that are associated um, with the Japanese performing arts and in particular um, the aesthetics associated with Japanese dance performance. So the aims of this video are to discuss an important aesthetic dichotomy that exists in Java and this is the Alus Kassar um, dichotomy, and then I want to discuss how this dichotomy relates to um, traditional Javanese dance, as well as discussing it in more general terms in relation to everyday um, Javanese life. And then I want to talk about how one particular dance known as Taringolek, which is a female dance, how this um, is an example that links male and female dance styles and aesthetics in performance. So in Java there exists a, a binary opposition or a dichotomy um, between two um, aesthetic values and these are um, the values of alus or kasar. Now, even though alus is spelled with a H, um, it tends to be pronounced with a silent H, and it can also be spelled A-L-U-S in the literature. So, in Java, value is really placed on things that are alus, and this is in the performing arts, in social interactions, in everyday life. So, someone who is alus is well-mannered, behaved, and conducts himself in a polite manner all the time. And alus is seen to have, if someone is alus, they seem to have an inner strength and um, inner power. In contrast, people who are very emotive, who are brash, who are outlandish, um, who run their mouth off, for example, they're seen as being kasar. And kasar is seen as a weakness in Javanese society um, because uh, an individual seem to have a lack of control. Now, the emotions uh, associated with alus and kathar are also very important to the performing arts, and we'll be talking about them later on in this presentation. But the notions of alus and kathar are also strongly linked to um, the Japanese language, which has um, is a hierarchical language, so it has different levels of speech and you speak these different levels of speech depending on your social hierarchy or your social status within the hierarchy in Japanese society. And it can be very impolite to use the incorrect um, language level when addressing particular people. So if you, for example, are a common, someone of the common, um, a commoner, for example, you might need to, you would usually have to speak up to someone of a much more noble status, um, but then someone of a noble status will speak down to someone of a common status. Alus and Kathar is also central to um, dance and drama performance, and it helps shape um, various narratives in performance. So by participating in traditional dance, traditional music making activities, traditional theatre activities, Javanese also reinforce everyday notions of the halus kasar binary opposition um, through performance. So having kind of briefly outlined the halus kasar dichotomy, um, let's move on to talk about some general features of traditional Javanese dance and then come back and discuss how we can map a, a loose kasar um, aesthetic values onto traditional Japanese dance. Javanese dance, if you haven't viewed clips on YouTube or if you watch it for the first time, it can seem to be quite different when compared with Western forms, particularly of social dancing or other staged dance styles such as ballet or jazz or tap, for example. When dance is performed, Javanese dance, their bodies tend to be positioned very close to the ground and they push into the ground with their body. And this is a, a value known as groundedness. 
and some dances are even performed with dancers squatting um, on the floor or even seated on the floor. Dancers tend to move uh, in step uh, like sequences around the performance space which can be a, a stage as in a western stage context but it can also um, be just a performance space with an audience gathered around. The body tends to be very straight um, in Japanese dance and principally it's the limbs that do a lot of the moving um, as well as movements of the head in particular ways. Uh, joints tend to um, be very angular in this performance mode um, but movements are very fluid and tend to be continuous all the time. Um, if there's also very little body contact, sometimes no body contact between dancers. And sometimes what can be most um, disingenuous for a Western audience when viewing this performance style is that generally Japanese dancers don't look at an audience. Okay, they don't gaze out and try to make a connection that way. More often than not, Japanese dancers have a downward gaze. So when Westerners view performances, it can feel that there, there's no connection there. But this um, is actually just the way that this dance style is performed. There's also various costume paraphernalia that's used in performances, such as headdresses, bracelets, um, kind of armbands, um, scarves are very important. And indeed, um, when dancers flick scarves, long scarves, the scarf is flicked with the hand and goes off and elongates the movement of the, the arm and the fingers. So there are some basic ideas about Japanese dance. And now let's talk about how we can relate the Alus Kassar um, dichotomy to this performance style. Well, in Java, there are kind of roughly four broad styles of dance performance. There's a female Alus style, a male Alus style, and then there's another male style called Gaga, and it is situated in between the male halus style and the male coarse or rough or unrefined style, which is known as kasar. Now, these styles are differentiated by degrees of movement. Um, that's to say that a kasar style, for example, will have big, broad movements that will cut through space much quicker than uh, the halus style performed by a male or a female dancer. In kasar style, for example, the dancer will take large steps and could move quite quickly across the performance space. In contrast, in the halus style, the dancers take smaller steps and might take longer to move um, from one position to the next. The height of arm and leg movements are also a giveaway um, uh, uh, when it comes to halus or kasar performance styles. Um, again, arm movements might be quite broad for kasar and legs might be positioned very far apart, but the opposite is true for halus styles. Um, the closeness of arms um, to the body as well would denote more of a halus style than a kathar performance approach. And in kathar styles, the performer might look maybe out more towards an audience than in a halus style. Halus styles are very subtle and very smooth and expressive. That's not to say that kathar styles are not expressive. They are, but they're much more sudden. Um, uh, maybe a bit more jerkier than uh, the subtle style of a loose performance. And finally, the build of a dancer is incredibly important when it comes to differentiating um, dance aesthetics and performance aesthetic styles. So, for example, I have quite broad shoulders and um, I'm not the thinnest person in the world, so that would mean that I wouldn't really perform a loose 
male performance style because my body is much more suited to performing either gagach or kasar um, performances. In contrast, someone who might be a lot thinner than me, maybe have a um, longer neck, um, that type of male dancer would be more suited to performing the loose male style. So having talked about alus and kathar and trying to relate that to um, Javanese dance um, styles, let's talk about some of the main kind of categories of dance that exist in Central Java. Well, in terms of female performance styles, there's dances such as the Bidaya and the Shrinti, um, which are dances performed by groups of women and they are court styles um, from the Kratons in Jajakarta and Surakarta, um, and they're very refined performance, um, they have very refined performance modes. Gombiang is another well-known dance style, and usually it's performed as a solo welcome dance um, to an evening's entertainment, for example. Many male dancers actually take their roots from martial or combat dances um, with self-defense movements. Um, so, for example, there are many dances um, based on the movements of soldiers, um, and they would denote kathar uh, performance styles. And there are also dance dramas, which are performances that involve a company of dancers, and they usually tell um, stories from the Indian epics, such as the Ramayana or the Mahabharata, or indigenous Javanese stories, such as the tales of Prince Panji. Originally, dance dramas would have either been performed by men or women, um, with men performing male and female parts, or women performing male and female parts. However, today, dance dramas are performed by a mixture of both male and female performers. So here are some pictures of some of the most famous and performance style. So this is a picture of Shrimpy um, dancers, and as you can see, they're all female. Um, they're all dressed in exactly the same costume. They will all perform exactly the same choreography um, so that it's in sync with one another. You can see that they have batik that have been wrapped around from the waist to um, their ankles, and actually you can't really see their legs. You can only see their feet. You can see that hanging in front of their batik, they have long scarves. And in performance, they'll take these long scarves and they'll flick them with their arms like this. And that will carry on the movement and, and make them nice and continuous and elongate, elongated. You can see that the bodices, which are made of black velvet, are, um, they hug the, the, the torso. Um, they have a belt on and they also have uh, uh, wristlets as well as um, a headdress with a, a red feather on the front. This is a picture of a bapang uh, dance, a bapang performer. Bapang is a form of mask dance in central and east Java. And you can see that the costume is very different to the costume worn by the shrimpy performers. So um, they're wearing kind of short, um, short pants, uh, made of velvet by the dancer here, and, and he has wristlets again and armlets, and he has um, some bells around one of his ankles. Masks also are a great indicator of aesthetics in Java and in Bali, and we can tell that Bapang is a karas um, form um, because by looking at the mask, just as a giveaway, it's red and red or ready brown or brown or ready pink colours denote crass performance aesthetics in Java and Bali. And we can also see that this one has a long nose and has big eyes, and the eyes look out from the mask directly towards the audience. Whereas if this was a more halus mask, it would be white or creamy or a kind of creamy yellow colour, 
the figures would be much smaller, it wouldn't have such a large nose, for example, and the eyebrows would be very much more refined, and the eyes, of course, would be narrower, and the gaze from the mask would look down more, and it wouldn't look out in the same way as the backhand mask does. And you can also see that the arms are very angular and the elbows lifted away from the body and the stance, the low stance, um, involves the, the legs and the feet being positioned and um, far apart. The final picture here is of a male and female dancer in a dance drama. And um, just from looking at it, um, it probably depicts um, the main prince and princess from um, the Ramayana, one of the Indian epics. And you can see that they have differing costume styles, but not male and female styles. And in this picture, you can actually see the female dancer holding the scarf and how it elongates the arm and the hand there. So having talked about some of the main forms of Japanese dance that you may encounter um, if you did a quick search on YouTube, for example, and I want to talk about a specific female dance that's called Tari um, Golik. And Tari Golik is a popular form that's often performed at weddings, concerts and competitions. And in this dance, a young um, a female dancer portrays a young woman who is grooming and dressing herself. So it's almost as if the character is, is getting ready to go out, for example. And you can see some of these grooming or preening movements. Um, the dancer has a kind of, they would be combing their hair. There's a specific, a specific movement that's performed. And again, you can see the scarf that's used. And the costume is actually quite similar to that worn by Shrimpy um, dancers that we saw earlier. But Tadagolic is important because as a female dance, it's a dance form that links female performance modes with male performance modes. And we're going to discuss how um, this is the case. So, as we're saying, there's the female performance style, then the golek, which is a link between female and refined male performance styles, and then there would be gaga, which I haven't included on this slide, and that would then um, lead on to strong male or coarse male, unrefined male performance styles, known as kras. So, traditionally, when females perform the female alus style, or the putri, which means princess style, dancers convey this calm, patient, and humble mood, which is called luruh in Japanese. However, in performance, Tarigolic dancers tend to portray a much more kind of spirited performance mode, which is known as branyak, which is kind of nearer towards the style or the performance mode that male dancers performing in the alus um, style would adopt in performance. So it's a female dancer kind of combining female and male characteristics um, in, in the dance and in the way that she performs this dance. And the combination of male and female attributes in Java is, is very significant um, because it's seen um, to give uh, um, the, the dancer a form of mystical power. So just as in the same way as historically Javanese kings would collect gamelan ensembles with different tuning systems, and by collecting gamelan ensembles and different tuning systems, they would seem to be harnessing a kind of mystical female power called sakti. And this sakti would then complement the male power that the king held in his position. So by harnessing male and female power, the king would actually have much more status and potency um, within Javanese society. But let's, before we get carried away with talking about power and potency to do with Tarigolic, let's see um, or discuss the origins of the dance. So Tarigolic actually originates from a male performance style. 
um, that were quite popular at the end of the 19th century in Craton performances. And in particular, this dance comes from the dance upon which Karigolic is based comes from the Kraton in Jogjakarta. So this original dance was called Kalana Alus, and it depicted a young man kind of preening himself, and he was very infatuated with himself. Um, and this notion of being infatuated with oneself is called Gandrum. And, however, Tari Golik kind of reverses this, and instead of it being a young man kind of preening himself, getting himself ready to go out or to do something, it's a prepubescent female that's the character in Tari Golik. However, both dances um, portray a mood of love, or asmara in Japanese, and the dancers incorporate movements that signify or denote preening and adornment. Adornment, so again, this notion of combing your hair or adjusting a bracelet, for example, looking at oneself in the mirror um, are movements common to both of these dances. So although it came from, or was based on a male Kraton style, Golic actually originated um, outside of the palace and was then appropriated by the royal palaces. Um, and we're now going to talk about um, what happened in this process of appropriation. So outside of the palace setting, traditionally a Golic was performed at the end of a dance opera, a Langandria performance. But because of its common or rakyat origins, when Golic was appropriated for performance inside the Kraton, the dance style was cleaned up a lot. It was made kind of more sophisticated than the choreography was, again, um, refined so that it would suit the Kraton environment and would be acceptable for, for performance in this context. So it would be more like female um, palace dances like Shrimpy and Bedaya, for example. These latter styles, Shrimpy and Bedaya, they epitomize the refined performance mode of female and loose dancers. Whereas if something was rakyat um, inside the palace, it might be seen to be ugly or more kasar. So that's why um, when it was appropriated, it was refined in this way. So, Golek was appropriated by the palace, but originally Tari Golek was also associated with another female performance style. And this was, um, or not a performance style, but also another style of female performer as well. And this female performer was called Aledek. And Aledek performed in a, a context known as Taiban, and Taiban literally means drinking party. And uh, Taiban usually has two sections to it. So in the first section, a female dancer would sing and dance um, with gamelan accompaniment. Uh, and then in the second section of the performance, um, men who had gathered to attend the event, they would be invited to perform with the Ledek as she sang and danced. And in her performance, as she would sing, a Ledek would use metaphors and various poetic conventions. Um, so she could be quite suggestive in some of the lyrics that she would sing. And because she was a female singing and dancing at the same time, there would seem to be a kind of sexual suggestion in some of the um, performances. And because of this sexual suggestion or this notion of a female performer singing and dancing and having much more sense of freedom in the improvised context of Taiwan, singer-dancers were often derided um, as being prostitutes. Now, sometimes this was the case, um, but not all Ledex um, are prostitutes. And it's wrong, it would be wrong to assume um, that Taiban is also a context always associated with prostitution. 
However, Ledex were also a very auspicious figure because they sang and they danced. And because of this, they were often invited to perform at um, rice harvests or the plant planting of the rice in order to um, assure fertility in a village so that the rice would have a good harvest. They would also perform for the ancestral animist spirits of a village to keep that spirit happy um, so that um, nothing bad would happen to the village. So there are similarities between um, Golic and Ledic performances. And when Golic was brought into the palace context, this notion of singing and dancing, um, as had been the case for Ledic, um, the royal palaces divorced singing and dancing in Golic um, performances. So the Golic dancer danced, and the singing that would have originally um, been encompassed in the singing and dancing performance of a Ledek, the singing was then done by the Tsinden in the Gamelan ensemble that accompanied Tari Golek. And this divorcing of singing and dancing in the royal court setting um, was quite significant because solo female singer-dancers such as the Ledic are attributed with these protective powers and that's why they perform for um, ritual occasions such as rice harvests or the planting of the rice or for Danyang which are village spirits. So by divorcing the singing and the dancing aspects of the performance, the king then harnesses more of the potency of the female performance because if the Tari Golic dancer continued to sing and dance, it might challenge the power of the king in his kraton. So this notion of trying to harness power is um, again another important theme um, that um, comes up in the Peggy Choi article. However, Golic dancers were also traditionally um, brought out at the end of a Langendria performance in order to get the audience to reflect upon a performance. And this notion of reflecting upon um, the performance also is another kind of play on words because agolic um, also has another meaning in Japanese society and it is a term that denotes a form of doll-like puppet and um, that's performed in a genre called wayang and golic. So there are lots of layers of meaning to do with tari golic and points of coincidence. So they're not just points of coincidence in gamelan music, but um, music and dance performance together. So the fact that a ledek is a singer and a dancer is also another huge point of coincidence um, that makes the ledek very an auspicious figure. Um, so by asking the audience to um, look for meaning, um, Golic is also a way of controlling power in this sense and kind of um, drawing the audience's attention to a specific meaning in a performance. So what have we talked about within the context of this video? So we've talked about how uh, the halus kasar dichotomy is integral to Javanese life, but it's also reflected in the performing arts. And people learn about the kasar halus dichotomy and reinforce these understandings through the performing arts. We've discussed how the halus kasar dichotomy can be applied to traditional Javanese dance through styles such as halus gaga and kasar. And we've examined Tari Golic as an example that links male and female dance styles. So it combines elements of Alus and Kassar. Um, and in doing so, um, because of its Ledek and Taiban origin, or, origin sorry, um, where 
Ledex would sing and dance. This notion of female singer-dancers as being powerful and auspicious figures is a very prevalent theme that comes through the Peggy Choi article. And whereas Tarragonic dancers in the context of the Kraton, um, they are, or they become, servants of the king. They perform for the king. They're there for his amusement. However, Ledek, in the context of Taliban and other performance um, spaces, such as um, ritual events, they are very auspicious and they harness their power in order to connect um, with ancestral spirits and um, other animist um, beliefs.